What's up team? Today I have some tips and tricks for how I do shear and moment diagrams. Hopefully these tips help you speed up the process a little bit. Now, one quick thing, I will be using a previous video that I've done uh, right here. Boom, yep, that one. And in that video, I derived the reactions for that system. And those are crucial for us to create our shear and moment diagrams. So if you're not clear on how to get those reactions, pause this video, head over to that other video so you know what's going on. And then from here, come on back and pick it up and let's knock out these shear and moment diagrams. All right, let's jump in. So moment and shear diagram, quick tips. You can go through kind of cutting up your, your system, finding your moments and your shears along the way, and then taking those values and plugging it in to create your diagrams. But there are some handy little uh, intuitive tips and tricks to draw those diagrams more quickly. First of all, I just wanna say that up is going to denote positive shear, which is going to be anything above this line, and then anything below it is negative, and negative will also be determined with forces that are acting downward based on the orientation of the system I have today. This W, the green loading here, the uniformly distributed load, is technically a negative load because it's applying continuous load downward. And then at all of our reactions, in order to have a balanced system in equilibrium, those reactions need to be applying a point load going upward to resist all of that downward uniform load. So that means all the reactions are positive and the arrows subsequently going upward visually show that as well. So that's how I'm going to be drawing my shear diagram. And let's start with reaction A. So I'm gonna start on the left-hand side. I'm gonna not necessarily go from left to right. I'm actually going to jump over to the right-hand side eventually, and then we're gonna meet in the middle. And that's part of the kind of tips and tricks to help move things along here. Upward of 14 kips, that's easy, with a value of 14 kips, because that's the value of at uh, reaction A. Easy. We have uniformly distributed load, which is going to drag our shear diagram down, but how much, what's the geometry of it? That's why we're here. Well, we're going to go from a region from A over to the hinge. And that is because the hinge in our previous problem or in our previous video talked about how they can translate shear through them, but they cannot translate moment through them. And subsequently, that means that at a hinge, the system is free to rotate. It's not, a, it's not rigid, which means that uh, it can deform independently on both sides of that hinge. And what that means for our system is that it's actually acting uh, from reaction A to the hinge as a simply supported member, like this. If we're just looking from the hinge to the left-hand side, um, forget about the rest of the system right now. That's what would be happening. And that's actually very straightforward because that is now just the condition of a simply supported beam with pinned reactions at the end. So that's an easy shear diagram. We know that the shear is equal to one another. It's equal but opposite at its ends. Well, we already know what the shear is at one of its ends. That's reaction A. So its other end, which is located at the hinge, is negative 14 kips. And now we can simply draw the shear diagram. And since this is a, a simply supported member, we know that the everything is symmetric. So we know that the shear is zero here, obviously from the diagram, but we can also be really smart and say, well, I also know the location where that happens. And that's simply the mid span between A and your hinge. Let's clean this up a little bit, make it look pretty. But what else do we need to do here? We're not out of the woods yet, because we still, have reaction B that we need to get to. If there is no load for the remainder from the hinge to reaction B, then your shear diagram would look like this. It would be linear moving across all the way to reaction B because there's no additional loading of your system. And you also can't say that the shear is dissipating or getting less or that there's a slope to it because you still have to remember that you have that original 14 kips that's hanging out at the hinge. Shear can translate through the hinge so you can't just forget about it. It doesn't just disappear, it doesn't just stop there. So that means it would move linearly across your shear diagram. I say all that, but we don't even have that condition. We know that we do have the uniform load that is continuously being loaded from the hinge to reaction B, which means our shear is increasing as it gets to B. Well, how much, it, how much is it increasing by? Well, first, let's draw the diagram so we know 
but we're gonna keep being loaded here. That is just stupendous. And we know that the loading doesn't change. So it still remains the 1.4 kips per foot. If the loading decreased or increased, that would change the slope of this line. But because the loading is the same, we know the slope matches the slope that we just drew. And of course I erase it, but ultimately that slope is linear. It's not, it's not changing. That value is simply the additional load along that five foot span. And that is simply the amount, get this additional triangle here. And that value is equal to the height of the triangle, which is just equal to five feet, which is the distance times the loading along that piece of the system, which is 1.4 KLF. So now we're gonna add seven onto the 14, gets us a final value of negative 21 kips. Well, now what can we do? What happens at reaction B now that we've made it here? Well, we're going to, again, use the reaction value that we already had given to us and that we solved in that previous video. And that is 38.5 kips with an arrow moving upward. Well, right now we're at negative 21 kips, so you simply add the 38.5 kips to your negative value because your whole system is gonna shoot upward on your shear diagram. And because we know that this axis here is zero kips, zero shear, we know that to get up to B would take us 21 kips, this value right here. Well, we have more than 21 kips, so we know we're going to go beyond uh, zero shear and actually move up into the positive range. That leaves us a remainder of 17.5 kips. We're going to now abandon reaction B and we're gonna move all the way over to the right side of our system. Because it's a continuous member over a pin support, that actually creates this type of boundary condition and loading condition. You have a cantilevered member, single span, you know your distance, you know your load, you know you're gonna have a moment and a shear, and we can find all those with just multiplying a couple numbers together. We have the span of five feet and we have the load of 1.4 kips per foot. And that is drawn as the following, seven kips. So I'm gonna erase all that. Well, now from this, we come back to our value of our reaction at C, 17.5 kips. Now we can do that jump because we know that we have a kind of an end boundary of our shear, the seven kips that we solved for. So we know that we need to jump up to a max of seven kips. So we're actually going to work in reverse. So we're not, we're not jumping up from the seven kips. We're actually going to go backwards and go subtract 17.5 kips from the seven kips, which will bring us somewhere down here, let's say. And this value is just gonna be equal to negative 10.5. Excellent. And we know uniformly distributed load, we're gonna get shear diagram looking like this. How do we know where we have zero shear? Well, we can find that location because that may be something that's asked by your professor or in the problem that you're solving. And we'll denote that as X because it's important. We're going to use basically similar triangles and geometry to solve for X. So we have the max value, 17.5 and negative 10.5 of our two triangles. When I say two triangles, I mean this one right here, this one right here. It's just a ratio of them. You're simply going to take the value in kips of your first triangle, 17.5 kips, and then you're gonna divide it by the sum of the value of all the triangles that you're looking at in this span. Um, for this calculation, you're not gonna worry about sign convention. It's not 17.5 minus 10.5. It's, it's the cumulative value of the shear. That is going to get you a ratio of 0 0.625, and then you're going to multiply that by the distance of the sum of the triangles that you were just looking at. So this total distance is 20 feet, as we see back up above here. I go highlighter, boom, spits out 12.5 feet is X. All right, and there you have it. You now have your full shear diagram. Let's move on to our moment diagram. So we have our kind of moment diagram set up. And first of all, what I would start with is the fact that use the rule for the hinge here, H, we know that moment cannot translate through this hinge. So that means moment has to be equal to zero at the hinge. From reaction A to the hinge is treated like a simply supported beam, which we know that the moment looks like this. And we know that our maximum moment is located at midspan with the equation WL 
squared over eight. We are going to do positive moment on the bottom and negative moment on the top. And we know that at the line, we'll have zero moment, which we'll uh, be denoting in kit feet. Uh, you can flip these if you want to. You could have negative on the bottom to keep it consistent with the shear diagram on the top. You can do the opposite of what I did for the shear diagram and do your negative on the top, positive on the bottom. It is technically up to you, just as long as you keep everything square and even and consistent. So apologies if you don't like doing it this way, but this is, this is just the way that I did it for this one. But there's my... Uh, you know, my signs on the side to help keep me straight. Well, we're gonna have a maximum positive moment and we're gonna have a diagram that looks like this to start. It's supposed to be even. And we know that at mid span, we'll have our maximum moment, which we can solve with WL squared over eight, WL squared over eight. I'm gonna show you two methods here. Plug everything in for that, 70 kip feet. Or you can take uh, if I go, what do I want to do here? I'll go black. In your shear diagram, the maximum moment for a simply supported member is also equal to triangular areas uh, under the curve of your simply supported member, which would be equivalent to the area of the black triangle that I just drew here. So let's say that we did that and you're like, well, how do I use a triangle to get an actual value? Well. The triangle, if I draw it in black right here, we know has a value of 14 kips, and we know has a length of 10 feet. See the units there, kips and feet? Multiply those together, that gets you kip feet, which is moment, and there you go. 14 kips times 10 feet divided by two, because you're just having, if you did 14 times 10, that would give you a, uh, a square. The, rect or the triangle is half of the square, so divide by two, and Lo and behold, that also spits out 70 kip feet. So two different methods, they yield the same answer. Whatever method you use is acceptable, but it, it should always get you the same answer. So be careful of that. You're not gonna do it one way and get you know something slightly different and do it another way and get something slightly different. They're equal, they have to be equal. Well, now we know that we are continuing to load our member, like we talked about for shear, from the hinge to reaction B. And again, we can use the trick that we did in black here, the area under the curve for that moment, because ultimately your moment diagram is going to move past and jump up and do something like this once it gets to reaction B. But what is the value up here? If I go black again, up in our shear diagram, that's equal to the area under this curve. Well, just split it up until you have easy geometry. So I would split it up like this, and now you have the information to find the area of that geometry. That spits out 87.5 kip feet. And now I'm gonna do the same thing like I did with our shear diagram. I'm actually gonna jump to reaction C and take care of that little cantilevered piece. This type of condition, you know that your moment is going to look like that. And that's going to be a negative moment. So again, we've denoted negative being on top and positive being on the bottom. And that, as we all know, is simply the equations uh, WL squared over two. And also, if you really wanted to, let's go black. You could also just find the area under the curve for the triangle, which also gets you 17.5 kip feet. They're the same. Boom, awesome, all right. And now we know that we have um, a, basically from reaction B to reaction C, since your members run continuous over those uh, reaction points or those boundary conditions, you really actually get, simplistically put, a condition that looks like that. And we know that our shear or our moment diagram looks something like this. And the last thing that we wanna figure out is what is our maximum positive moment for that curvature down there? And that can be solved by using our X value that we solved for in our shear diagram. So we're gonna do the following. We know that we have a maximum moment, 87.5, and we can work from either um, this point, reaction B, or from reaction C, and I'll show you. 
Let's start by using reaction B. Well, we know that X equals 12.5 feet, which is where our shear is equal to zero, which is where we know we have our maximum moment. And we know that the maximum moment can also be calculated from the area under the curve of our triangles in our shear diagram. So we're gonna use the green triangle. And I'll show you if you started from reaction C, you would use the blue triangle, but you'll see that either uses will get you the same answer. 17.5 kips times the length X of 12.5 feet divided by two, because it's a triangle to get the area, 109.375 kip feet. That is the maximum moment, after I drop my pen, for um, between reactions B and C, but it's split. So it's, it's the maximum moment, which means that it's from here to here is 109.375 kip feet. But we only wanna know if I go blue, this portion of it in order to get the maximum at the crest. So we need to subtract out, if I go highlighter here, this portion. Well, that portion is simply equal to the 87.5. 21.875 kip feet is the value of the positive moment at that crest. Well, what happens if we did it from reaction C? So we'll go blue, and now we need the area under the triangle or under the curve of the blue triangle. 10.5 uh, is our kips. And then this distance is 20 feet minus X. We'll call it uh, X prime. Uh, what is that? 7.5 feet. So 10.5 kips, 7.5 feet divided by two gets you the area of the triangle, gets you 39.375 kip feet but we need to subtract the moment at reaction C, which gets us, lo and behold, 21.875 exactly. They match one another. It means that the calculations you ran, that's kind of my safety to say, okay, I, I did this correctly, but everything's aligning, whether I take it from this direction or that direction, they work out. So it's a little kind of factor of safety to check yourself. If you found yourself learning something new or you have a new tip or trick for your next shear or moment diagram, let me know in the comments down below. If you didn't, hey, no need to like, it's fine. I get it, we get it, I get it. But if you do think you're gonna be back here sometime soon in the auditorium, consider subscribing so you don't miss any of my upcoming content. And if you're still in the mood to, you know, absorb some kind of more structural engineering and analysis, check out some of my other videos, maybe up top here, maybe to the side, maybe to the side. I don't know exactly where they're gonna be. But I hope to see you here sometime soon. And until next time, this is Rich with Team Kestaba. Peace.